Chapter 3 of Eternal Security by Charles Stanley. Chapter 3 is entitled Saved and Secure. Not too long ago, a teenager in our church brought two of her friends to meet me. I felt impressed to ask them about their salvation. Have you both been saved, I asked. They both nodded that they had. I took it a step further. Tim, I said, tell me about it. He related his experience of going forward in a service, praying with an elder and being presented to the congregation. Darla, I said, speaking to the other guests, why should God let you into heaven? She looked down. Well, I don't know. I don't go to church very much anymore, but I sure like your church, she said. I knew I had made them both a little uncomfortable, so I talked to them about my own struggle with that question. I showed them a couple of verses that made it clear how we can know we are saved. Then I asked them again, so why do you think God should let you into heaven? Tim spoke up because I believe in God and try to do my best. I had to laugh. Lord, I thought to myself, how many people sit out here week after week who would claim in a heartbeat that they are saved, but haven't the foggiest idea how they got that way. Tim, I said, sometimes I don't explain this very well. Let me try again. We went through another round of verses, complete with my best illustrations. After 20 minutes, Tim shot straight up in his chair and said, it's because his death paid for my sins. It was as if someone had turned on a switch in his mind. Actually, someone had. Both Tim and Darla trusted Christ as their Savior that evening. As we were getting up to go, Darla said, I never heard it explained that way. I'm so glad I came. The next section subtitled, First Things First. Before we can proceed any further with our discussion, we need to grasp one important truth, point. What do we mean by salvation? The question we are addressing in this book is whether or not salvation can be lost. We would do well to understand exactly what it is we are arguing cannot be lost. If a man's or woman's understanding on this question is as foggy as Tim's and Darla's, he or she has good reason to doubt the doctrine of eternal security. Where there is uncertainty concerning how salvation is attained, there will be confusion over whether it can be man maintained. My experience has been one that those who have problems with the doctrine of eternal security have a distorted understanding of what took place at the cross. That may sound as if I am being critical, but in reality, I am more puzzled than anything else. When I think of Calvary and the price that was paid to provide me with salvation, the thought of my having the power to undo all of that seems preposterous. Preposterous. This next section is subtitled Salvation. Sin brought about the need for man's salvation. Sin is like a genetic disease that once, entered, once introduced into the human race affected everyone thereafter. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through the one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. The one man here is Adam. His sin poisoned the human race. Every man, woman, and child since Adam was born a sinner. Romans 5.19, For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners. The next section is subtitled, Rotten to the Core. Sin goes deeper than merely an association with some distant relative. Sin has contaminated our very nature. Man is born with an inclination toward evil, a bias away from good. If you don't believe me, ask any preschool worker or kindergarten teacher. Children never need a lesson in being bad. It just comes naturally. Granted, some are worse than others, but each child in his or her own way eventually demonstrates a defiant self-centeredness willing to challenge any and all authority. 
the combination of our inherent sinfulness and our ensuing acts of sin puts us in bad standing with God, the Bible goes as so far as to say that we are condemned. Romans 5, 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. The term condemn is a legal term meaning to declare guilty. We are each guilty of sin resulting from our relationship with Adam and sins resulting from our personal disobedience. The next section is subtitled, The Result. Just as sin caused Adam and Eve to be separated from God in the beginning, so sin results in man's separation from God now and potentially for eternity. Paul writes in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. And again, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. These familiar passages say a great deal about the consequences of sin. When the Bible speaks of death, it does not refer to annihilation. Nowhere does the scripture teach the annihilation of the soul. Everyone will live forever somewhere. Death means separation, specifically separation from God. The second verse explains why sinners must die or be separated from God. Our sin makes us ineligible for perfection. God is holy and pure in nature. He is the essence of love and goodness. Those who are to have fellowship with him must be holy and pure as well. They must be guiltless, guilty of no sin whatsoever. His nature demands it. His nature, by definition, determines the standard for those who desire a relationship with him. To put it another way, certain things must be true of people to make them acceptable to God. This is not some arbitrary set of rules God established to make it difficult for us. If that were so, Christ died in vain. God should have just changed the rules, but God's high standard flows from his unalterable nature. And man has fallen short of that standard. God's holiness can be compared to fire. Certain things must be true of any material that is to survive being exposed to fire. The nature of fire determines what will and will not endure the heat. God's holiness can be compared to water. Certain things must be true of any animal that is to live under water. The nature of water demands that these things be true. Any animal that is not suited to survive under water will drown if held under the water. Certain things must be true of the man or the woman who intends to establish a relationship with holy God. There are changes to be made, changes that we are hopelessly incapable of making ourselves. Our sin has called us to fa caused us to fall short of God's standard. Thus, in our natural state, we are destined for a godless eternity. This next section is entitled Guilt Removal. The primary change that must be made centers on the prom problem of guilt. Salvation at its core is the removal of guilt, both personal and imputed. Herein lies the problem. If God is perfect, he is perfectly just. How can a perfectly just God make a guilty person not guilty? As Dr. Ryrie says in Basic Theology, there are only three options open to God as sinners stand in his courtroom. He must condemn them, compromise his own righteousness, or receive them just the way that they are, or he can change them into righteous people. If he can exercise the third option, then he can announce them righteous, which is justification. <laughs> Dr. Rowry begins to our discussion of a, a, a very important term, justification. To justify people is to declare them not guilty. In the book of Romans, Paul makes it clear that Christians have been justified in Romans 5.1. 
To him, there is no conflict between God's justice and his willingness to justify sinners. He says in Romans 3.26, for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God does not wear rose-colored glasses. He is not in the habit of pretending something is true when in fact it isn't. So how can he declare guilty men and women not guilty? Paul sums up the answer to that question in his second letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God made a swap. Actually, the correct, correct term is imputation. He imputed our sin to Christ and his righteousness to us. To impute something to people is to credit them with it. Christ credited us with his righteousness, including all of its rights and privileges. But there was still the problem of our sin. God could not remain just and ignore sin. There was a penalty to be paid. So Christ was credited with our sin. Consequently, he suffered death in our place and in doing so paid the penalty we had incurred. This next section is entitled, My God, My God. You may be wondering if our sin demanded a death, but this death involved eternal separation from God, how could Christ pay the penalty for our sin and still sit at the Father's right hand? If he took our place, would he not have to be separated from God? The answer to that question is yes. For Christ to truly pay for our sins, he would have to suffer punishment originally intended for us. And he did. Concerning the death of Christ, Mark says in Mark 15, 33 and 34, And when the sixth hour had come, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As Christ hung on the Christ, cross, God abandoned him. The separation was so real that Christ even addressed God differently. Until that time, he had referred to God as his father. Suddenly, however, the fellowship was broken and Jesus shouted out, not my father, but my God. The intimacy was gone. Christ was alone. The penalty of your sin was death physically and spiritually. Sin demanded separation from life and God. And so Christ willingly paid that penalty in our place. The awesomeness of God's plan cannot be fully appreciated until we understand how and why Christ was able to reestablish fellowship with his estranged Heavenly Father. The writer of Hebrews explains in Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats, goats and cows, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having or obtained eternal redemption. After paying the penalty of our sin, Christ marched right back into the presence of God. How? What, a sta what enabled fellowship to be restored? Christ's own righteousness. Uh, sin is the barrier between man and God. Christ had no sin. Uh, therefore, there was nothing to keep Christ from reuniting with the Father after a brief period of separation. Christ's sinlessness made him the only acceptable sacrifice for sin. This next sub subtitle is Signing Up. Faith is the means by which the saving work of Christ is applied to the individual. Specifically, salvation comes to the individual when that person places trust in Christ's death 
on the cross as the complete payment for sin. The biblical support for this idea comes from a grammatical construction that occurs repeatedly when faith is mentioned in connection with forgiveness and salvation. This construct consists of the Greek word that means believe, followed by a little word translated in or on, depending on the context of the passage. Uh, the combination of the term for believe and this little preposition is unique to the New Testament. In other words, the writers of the New Testament were forced to coin a new phrase accurately communicate to accurately communicate their unique message. John 6, 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. John 2.23 Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his signs which he was doing. The gospel writers understood that Jesus was calling men to do more than simply believe in his existence. They knew from their own experience that Christ was calling on sinners to put their trust in him, in his life, in his words, and ultimately in his death as payment for their sin. Gaining eternal life and becoming children of God are the Apostle Paul, John's terms for salvation. Paul ref prefers the term mentioned earlier, justification. Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 5, but the, to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. This next section is called a simple plan for sinful, sinful man. God's plan is so simple. We are guilty. Our guilt earned us death. Christ died in our place. We admit we are guilty. We trust that Christ was punished in our place and we are declared not guilty. That's it. And yet that is what some argue that we can lose. But how? How can I lose Christ's payment for my sin? Can God declare me guilty after he has already declared me not guilty? The last subtitle is, but wait. But wait, the skeptics counter. What about the sins you commit after he declares you not guilty? Good question, but think about it. Which of your sins did Christ take on the cross 2,000 years ago? Which of your sins was he punished for? If he died for only part of your sins, for instance, the one you had committed up to the point of salvation, how can you ever get forgiveness for the sins you commit after that? Would Christ not have to come and die again? And for that matter, again and again and again? If all your sins were not dealt with on the cross 2,000 years ago, there is no hope for you. God declared you not guilty the first time based on the provision of his son. On what basis could he declare you not guilty the second time? The next time Christ shows up here on earth, his agenda will not include dying for the sins he missed the first time around. See Hebrews 9.28. The scripture is clear. Christ, unlike sheep and goats, needed to be offered up only once. And God accepted that as the once and for all sacrifice for all men's sins. Hebrews 9, 24 through 28 says, Christ entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. 
But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. From the historical vantage point of the cross, all your sins were yet to be committed. If Christ died for only one of them, he died for all of them. What was the difference? He need not come again to pay for sin. On that day, he took upon himself all the sin of mankind, past, present, and future. How can anyone possibly undo all of this? If Christ took upon himself every single one of your sins, what is going to cause God to reverse this verdict of not guilty? Hallelujah, not a thing. At the end of the chapter, there's a little section called, Think About It. Why should God let you into heaven? If your answer includes words such as, Try, my best, church, believe in God, Sunday school, teach, or give, chances are that you still haven't come to grips with the simple truth that salvation is by faith alone. Let me ask the question another way. What are you trusting in to get you into heaven? Is it Christ plus something? Or can you say with confidence that your hope and your trust are in Christ and Christ alone? Next week, we will look at chapter four entitled Adoption.